Hey everyone, welcome to Things We Said Today. This is a Beatles podcast that deals not only with the Beatles, but the Beatles individually as well, and, and artists and topics that are related to the Beatles. It's a bi-weekly podcast. My name is Darren DeVivo. I'm one of three hosts of Things We Said Today. I'm from WFUV, a radio station in New York City, located at 90.7 FM and 90.7 FM HD2. For you few HD heads out there, you can stream WFUV at WFUV.org and also listen on the WFUV app. I've been at WFUV on the air since 1984. And here on Things We Said Today, I am joined by my good friends, Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen. You know Ken. He's uh, been hosting Beatles programs on the radio for almost 40 years. One of the stations he was at, WDHA in northern New Jersey, for a time was on XM Radio, currently hosts Every Little Thing, which is a syndicated Beatles show. But when a virus isn't running rampant around the globe, you can catch Every Little Thing Wednesday nights at 8 at WNHU in Southern Connecticut. And uh, Ken is also one of the hosts of the solo Beatles video cast. They're brave. They turn on their cameras. Talk more talk, which happens like this show does biweekly. But they happen, uh, they have their show specifically Monday nights at nine on Facebook. That's Talk More Talk. Ken Michaels, one of the hosts. And Ken, how are you tonight? I am good, Darren. Good to be with you. Good to be with you, Alan. And a big hello to all of our Beatle fans listening. Now, it's going to be a, a Ken Michaels love fest that we're going to kick up in a few minutes. So don't go anywhere. Alan it's a Cozen? good thing. It's a good what? thing this is only audio then. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, Cozen, uh, Alan Cozen was a New York Times music critic for roughly four decades and um, is still writing today and still occasionally can be found in the New York Times. Or at least what he writes can be found in the New York Times. You can't find him. Uh, also the Wall Street Journal and other publications as well. And Alan's got uh, numerous Beatle books under his belt and it is very hard to sit as a result of that. Um, uh, the Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, one of the books, the other, Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, is another one of Alan Cozen's books. And uh, Alan is our other host here on Things We Said Today. How are you, Alan? Okay, Darren, how are you doing? And hello, everyone. All right. Great. And Ken? Now, <laughs> Very good, Alan. <laughs> okay, now we've all settled that. Before we kick off our Ken Michaels Love Fest and... <laughs> Our topic for this show, Ken Michaels is here with all of the news that he can fit into uh, a podcast. You're going to scare everybody off by continuously <laughs> saying uh, love fest here. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's wondering what you're talking about. It's a family podcast. It'll be nice and it'll be tame. Okay, very good. Well, you just mentioned that Alan uh, wrote for the New York Times. He just wrote an article for the New York Times, as a matter of fact. And it has to do with our first news item, which is actually the sad news of the passing of Astrid Kirscher. Astrid, as we all know, was a very good friend of the Beatles during their Hamburg days. Uh, she's known for her amazing photography. She took lots of great now considered iconic photos of the group. Among the most famous was of the five Beatles. That's John, Paul, George, Stu, and Pete at a fairgrounds in front of an open truck. And um, I do have a quote here from Astrid that was in Rolling Stone. On meeting the Beatles, she said, they were all so young and I was so different. I was a few years older. I had my own flat, my own car, my own career. They hadn't met anyone like me before. In some ways, I was more like a mother figure. Hmm. Well, she and Klaus Vormann and Jürgen Vollmer, all artists who live the what's considered the bohemian lifestyle, they were among their closest friends during their time in Hamburg. Astrid is credited for giving the Beatles their haircut, although you do hear conflicting stories about that. Alan, you want to expand on that? Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, the thing I wrote for the Times was basically her obit. Um, they call me every now and then to do those, um, and especially, especially if it's Beatles related. Um, you know, Astrid, you've seen pictures of Astrid. There's that famous self-portrait um, of her black and white. All, all of her stuff was black and white. She hated color. 
And you could see that her hair is in close to what we would think of as an early beetle cut. Um, and Astrid and Klaus and Jürgen all wore that haircut. I think Klaus actually called it the Caesar cut. But they were very influenced by French students, the French student existential movement, that kind of thing. Uh, that that was what interested them, partly because they were, you know, as, as I think Klaus and Astrid have explained it, it was partly uh, because as young Germans, they were feeling very sort of um, had mixed feelings about you know they they weren't actually in the war they were they were infants but um you know they they had some sense of collective guilt about that and so they they turned uh, more towards french culture than towards their own culture the uh dispute about the haircut is has something to do with the fact that um you know the official story or at least as astra told it was that she cut stew's hair in the brushed forward you know straight early Beatle way. He turned up to play with the Beatles wearing that and they basically made fun of him. They were still wearing the kind of modified Elvis do, you know. And uh, then George, according to Astrid, also got one of those haircuts. And then a year later, when John and Paul went to Paris and visited Jürgen, they asked Jürgen to cut their hair that way too. Now, there is a German author named Thorsten Knoblau, who's, you know, does a lot of uh, research and good work, and uh, he's working on a new book where he is going to show, he says, that George did not have his hair cut early on, the way Astra tells it, uh, that he had his hair cut basically after John and Paul got back from Paris. And the reason Astrid always said that Pete never got his hair cut that way is because his hair was very curly and that the, that cut didn't work for him, you know, uh, whereas the rest of them were straight. So, it, you know, it worked. So I think that's uh, that's what you're referring to, I guess, right? Yeah. And from whenever I whenever I've heard Paul tell the story, he mm -hmm. always brings up Jürgen. Mm -hmm. I never hear him bring up Astrid. Yeah. When it comes to the haircuts. Right. I mean, you could say that Astrid was influential in the haircut in the sense that she had her hair that way, but so did Jürgen and Klaus, and that she cut Stu's that way, so Stu was the first member of the Beatles to have his hair done that way. You know, I, I it's a fine line, really. It depends how you want to interpret it. Uh, you know, Jürgen definitely did the haircut on John and Paul. I think Astrid admits that much. Um, but... You know, there were so many other things about Astrid that were influential. I mean, her photo style, the fact that, like, those were the first professional photos that they had taken. And, uh, you know, they really they really liked them. And she also went to England to photograph them around the time of Hard Day's Night. And I think she may have photographed them a couple of other times, too. And... Um, you know, the, the With the Beatles cover is often said to be influenced by Astrid. Whether that's totally true, I'm not sure whether the Beatles asked Robert Freeman to, to do it that way because of Astrid's pictures, I'm not sure, or whether they showed them to him. He basically has, you know, while not denying it, he tells a different story about, you know, how he set up the picture and all that. And and in and, and his telling, Astrid doesn't come into it. So, um, but still, you know, I think for most of us who look at the cover of With the Beatles or Meet the Beatles, we look at it and we say, yeah, that's a picture like one of Astrid's, right? So mm. it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, she is listed as being a set photographer on the set of A Hard Day's Night. Yeah, that's right. And I asked uh, Mark about that. And, you know, because I thought, well, okay, if she was a set photographer, maybe she took the photos that are on the cover of Hard Day's Night, even though the cover design is by Robert Freeman. And Mark said, no, those are those are all Freeman. I have no idea what she did on the set of Hard Day's Night. So she is listed in, in the IMDb listing, for instance, it's she's given as the set photographer, but don't really know. Uh, mm. Maybe a lot yeah. of the stills you see from, from the set of A Hard Day's Night are Astrid's. It's possible. Yeah. 
I have this image of Astrid based on watching Backbeat, <laughs> right. you know, and just this idea of doing photos the old fashioned way, you know, dipping the negatives into chemicals and taking them out and putting them in water and hanging them, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, she really took phenomenal portraits right. of uh, John and George in particular. Yeah, and she printed them in a very large format, and she said that they had never seen pictures of themselves or maybe even photographs in a format that large before, so they were really impressed with it. I think they were also impressed by the fact that Astrid was not out there selling her photos of them all the time. You know, she took them, and then as she said, if people look up my obit, it's, I mean, it's perpetually on the New York Times website. Um, you can look it up, but um, at the end, she talks about the fact that, you know, financially, she was very silly. She just gave people negatives of her Beatles photos. She didn't uh, didn't really sell them very much. She just photographed for the love of it, you know. Mm. Uh, and basically, after the, the Beatles things, after the Hard Day's Night um, assignment, um, she also, by the way, took the picture of George that's in Wonderwall in the insert, uh, and that's a very Astridish photo, isn't it? It's you know black and white and shadowy and stuff like that. But um, yeah, but you know she did not commercialize it, and um, but the thing is, she she may not have had to in a way. I, I in in putting the obit together, you know, one of the things that the Times is always has us do is find out what the parents um occupations were and her mother it turned out was independently wealthy so it's very possible that that got passed on to astrid and that you know she didn't really have to do stuff for a living mm. she uh, but she did because she did what she liked you know after the photography which she sort of gave up on because she felt that everybody was only interested in just the Beatles pictures so she did interior design and uh, then she opened later on she opened a photo shop and did sell some of her Beatles pictures but it you know she wasn't out there like a lot of other photographers you know marketing them quite as much it was really only towards the end of her life that she began to realize that this is the thing to do, you know, and, and they didn't begrudge her that. But but I think yeah. they, they respected the fact that she hadn't done it in all those years as well. Yeah, she didn't really care about the fame. Yeah. Or the recognition, you know, but she was proud of the fact she was there at that time is something that's such a big part of history now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But uh, in the very beginning, Astrid actually dated Klaus Vorman. And uh, when Stu arrived, she immediately fell in love with him. And as we all know, Stu chose to leave the Beatles to have a life with Astrid and pursue his career as an artist and to go to the Hamburg College of Art. They were engaged to be married, but Stu died before that ever happened yeah. of a brain hemorrhage. That was in April of 1962. She did actually marry in 1967 to Gibson Kemp, who was the drummer that replaced Ringo and Rory Storm in the Hurricanes. Mm -hmm. And that marriage lasted seven years. But she always referred to Stu as the love of her life. Mm -hmm. And we also know that she was an advisor for the film Backbeat. She did put out a few books of her own photography. I know one of them's called When We Was Fab. And there was one that she collaborated on with Klaus called Hamburg Days. Do you have any of those books, Alan? Uh, yeah, there? I have all of them except when no. it was fab. Uh, I'm not sure how that eluded me, but um, and and it's sold out now. It's a Genesis book. I immediately went on to the Genesis website to you know see if I could get it, and it's it's uh, it's sold out. But I have the others. There's Liverpool Days. There's Golden Dreams. Those are collaborations with another German photographer, you know, who went with her, Max Scheller, who went with her to Liverpool to shoot the Beatles and other Liverpool groups. So uh, there's that. OK, so Golden Golden Dreams, Hamburg Days. Uh, there are a couple of other commercial ones. You know, those are all Genesis books and they're really expensive. But but there were a couple of books of her photography that came out um, as well. Can't remember the names. The names of Beatles titles, I think. Yeah, unfortunately, I never got to see these books or look at the photos, but I sure would love to. Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, and we do have a few quotes from people in the Beatle world to comment on Astrid's passing. Ringo said, God bless Astrid, a beautiful human being, and she took great photos. Peace and love. Paul took a few days before he actually put out a statement. And it reads, very sad news this week about Astrid Kirscher. Astrid was a dear friend from my Hamburg days with the Beatles. Another friend, Klaus Vorman, told me she had passed away, and this brought back memories of our days in the clubs in Hamburg. Astrid looked unique. She had a short blonde haircut and wore a slim black leather outfit, which made her look like a funky pixie. <laughs> she would come to the club with Klaus and another friend, Jürgen Vollmer, and the three of them made quite an impression on us four lads from Liverpool. Their wit and conversation was really stimulating, and we fell in love with Astrid's style. Astrid took beautiful photographs of us. She used black and white film and achieved a stunning mood in her pictures that we all loved. She had a great sense of humor and later went on to marry Stuart, our bass player. This yeah. has caused, uh, you know, yeah. a yeah. bit of uh Well, not to uh, mention uh, that, that, he says, that he says us four Beatles when there were five of them at the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, I, got, I got to say, the, the people that j- jumped all over those those he, errors on he, facebook like needed needed a smack yeah he doesn't write them you know other people do his social media stuff so it's it's not even him you know he 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 probably knows that she didn't marry Stu and that there were five of them i would think he would look this over before it goes out you would think and he may and he may have just missed it you know you think he yeah. you think he might throw some bullet points towards whoever writes these things you would think yeah yeah but, but you know so much of what i've read whenever somebody passes away sounds like it really comes from him it sounds like it comes from the heart yeah especially like the one that i just read a couple of weeks ago about little richard right it really sounds like they are his own words yeah, so i know, think there probably are at yeah. times yeah in some cases he may just tell them what he wants to say and it gets tweeted out by someone at mpl but um yeah in this case well and also the fact that it took a few days was you know perhaps strange but you know if you if you read if you read tune in which again you know if you're interested in astrid and you haven't read tune in you should read it because he has mark lewis and has quite a lot of information about her and Stu and you know the relationship between astrid and Stu's family which was very rough you know they they had been, you know, in the war only 15 years earlier, and uh, you know, Liverpool was bombed regularly by the Germans, and Stu's family just had was, you know, very anti-German, and they didn't like the idea that Stu was involved with a German girl, and they mm. weren't nice to her really. If you know, it's it's and and that's all in the book. It's very interesting stuff. Yeah, they probably didn't like the fact that Stu went over to Germany. Period. It could be, um, yeah. but but another thing that, that that does come through there is that you know I think Astrid ultimately became friendly with Paul, but during the Hamburg days, um, she basically said that he was her least favorite of five. You know, so possibly, possibly there's some friction there that is why it took a couple of days to come out. I don't know. I've got no idea, but. You know, because I think they became friends later. In fact, you I would know, for that matter, um, Astrid really disliked all the Beatles except for Stu when she first met them. You know, and she came around fairly quickly. But but she just thought of them as sort of tough leather, you know, rock and rollers. And you know, and Stu was the only one that really, really interested her. Uh, and and I can see that because he was really an artist, not a musician. And so they had this common ground. But she soon came around to the other Beatles, too. So, Seems to me, based on a lot of quotes I've read from her, she really liked George a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think she said she was closest to George, you know, after Stu. Really liked John, too. Hmm. All right. And actually, I would much rather Paul take his time at putting out statements rather than rush something out. Sure. You know, I, it it makes better sense. A lot of people are on Paul's case. They were, you know, they were expecting something on the spot. And sometimes Paul doesn't look very good when he says something quickly. Yeah. When someone very close to him passes away. So, uh, 
Anyway, the rest of that quote from Paul, he says, I have so many fond memories of our time together in the club or her home or a trip to the nearby seaside resort in Lübeck. So sad for all of us who were her friends to lose such a lovely lady from our lives. I will miss her, but will always remember her and her cheeky grin with great fondness. God bless you, Astrid. See you, love, Paul. All right. You want uh, just a couple more quotes? I got one here from Olivia Harrison. She says, Dear Astrid, just yesterday I held your Christmas card, stood for some moments with it in my hand and communed with you, addressed in gold ink, always a gold star floating on a red envelope. I wondered how you were, then sent you imaginary flowers. Astrid is and was the sweetest woman, so thoughtful and kind and talented, with an eye to capture a soul. Our family loved her and none more than George. I am truly saddened but honored to have known her. And Danny Harrison said, Dearest Astrid, I really wish I could have spent more time with you in this life. You were always so kind and loving towards me. May God bless you always. Okay. In other news, some cancellations to announce. The International Beatles Convention, which takes place every year in Liverpool at the end of August, has been canceled. Danny Harrison announced on his Facebook page that Jeff Lynne's ELO tour of the UK that was due to start in November has also been canceled. Abbey Road on the River just held a live streaming event for Memorial Day weekend, May 23rd through the 25th. And they previously announced that they were postponing their event from May until October. But on their website this past weekend, they actually featured live concerts all three days on their website, abotr.com, and also on their Facebook page. It was actually 10 hours of tribute bands from around the world performing. They are still planning to hopefully stage their festival at uh, the Big Four Station Park in Jeffersonville, Indiana. That's October 8th through the 11th. But Abbey Road on the Island, which is something completely different, it's still put together by Gary Jacobs. Um, the same person who organizes Abbey Road and the River. That was an event scheduled on Long Island, the first ever. It was going to be on Labor Day weekend. And that's been postponed indefinitely so far. The cassette tape containing two versions of the unreleased Paul McCartney Ringo Starr composition, Angel in Disguise, sold last Tuesday at Omega Auctions in Cheshire, England for $9,900. It was less than half its expected price. There's a new book coming out from David Bedford. It's called The Country of Liverpool. It explores country music's influence on the Beatles and what it meant to the Liverpool music scene. Um, Also, there's a brand new TV commercial airing right now using a cover of the Beatles song, All Together Now, which I don't know if you guys have heard it, but uh, do you know who, who sang the song? No. I have heard it, but I don't know who sang it. Darren? Uh, I do not. Okay. Happens to be Lizzo, one of the uh, hottest singers of today. Mm -hmm. Uh, The ad announces the launch of Facebook's Messenger Rooms. Okay. Carlos Santana has just recorded a new version of John Lennon's Imagine with his wife and percussionist Cindy Blackman. The song was recorded to benefit Why Hunger's Rapid Response Fund, helping those in need now more than ever. And Sirius XM's Beatles channel premiered the song on their Fab Forum show this week on Wednesday uh, with Santana talking about this new cover of Imagine. And a few other news items. Another new book is coming out on John Lennon in November. It's called Dream Lovers, John and Yoko in New York City. It includes photographs taken by renowned celebrity photojournalist Brian Hamill. Some of them are new and unseen photos of John and Yoko. There are photos from John's only full-length solo gig at Madison Square Garden. And Hamill delivers his own insider view of the music icon with intense, intimate photographic portraits and insightful essays. It's called Dream Lovers, John and Yoko in New York City. And finally, last night, we're recording this on May 26th. Last night, Jimmy Fallon's Tonight Show had a holiday special with highlights from past shows, including when he and Paul McCartney sang Scrambled Eggs back in 2010. 
All right. That is uh, all the news I've got for you. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. All the news that's fit to print, although we're not printing the news. At the top of the show, I kept uh, making mention of the fact that uh, we're going to have a Ken Michaels Love Fest, and it is time for that Love Fest right now. You know, Ken is either at, ha, is about to hit, or has just passed a milestone in his broadcasting career. And it's 2,000. Count them. One. <laughs> two. No, I'm just kidding. Count them. 2,000 radio programs. And now these are Beatle programs we're talking about, right, Ken? They're all on the Beatles. From the beginning of my career, starting Beatles radio shows, in March of 1982 to the current time. And I've surpassed 2000 at this you point. You have to, okay, so that yeah. was the deal. It was a little bit of a, I know it was kind of like, uh, uh, what was the one millionth run scored in Major League Baseball? What was the 2000, the Beatles show that Ken Michaels hosted? So this 2000 uh, uh, milestone doesn't even include the non-Beatles radio programs you've hosted through the years. Uh, Not but at that all. That is quite an accomplishment. And I said, you know, at the beginning of the show, uh, when I introduced you that we're closing in on 40 years of Ken Michaels broadcasting, what's the number roughly approximately of years are we talking? Altogether since 1982, so it's 38 years. Okay. Nobody told me math was going to be involved in this show. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, first off, obviously at the top, congratulations on, Thank you. on a pretty incredible milestone. And yeah, of course, congratulations, um, Ken. Thank you. So Thank I you. Don't I'll get mine in there too. Question. Uh, <laughs> I think the obvious question, which is also maybe the stupidest question, did you think you'd be doing it so many years and for so, so many shows? Absolutely not. In fact, okay, the we'll idea to do on. a Beatles show, the idea to do a Beatles show didn't even come from me. I never even thought about doing one, but a friend of mine that I went to college with when I worked at the radio station on Long Island, which was at uh, New York Tech the New York Institute of Technology in Old Westbury, Long Island. Uh, a lot of the students there at the radio station knew I was a big Beatle fan from playing Beatle music on my regular shifts and wearing Beatle shirts. And um, a friend of mine suggested that I do it. And up until then, I never even thought about doing a Beatles radio show. So um, it started on a Sunday night. I had a three-hour shift from 10 to 1, which was the least desirable shift of the week because from 1 to 6, Everything was automated at the station. Nobody wanted to work late at night and on a weekend. And um, I started doing the show at midnight, from midnight to one, just playing an hour of Beatles. And um, I got no response at that time. And then when I moved it, I suggested to move it to 10 o'clock for an hour. And once I did that, then the phones lit up like crazy. And the, the thing that was really remarkable about the radio station, this is WNYT for New York Tech, they only had a very small radius to carry their signal on the FM, but our signal was also on cable television. And it was only a mono signal too. And it was on one of those channels where you see a swap and shop type program. Mm -hmm. but people actually listened to us on cable television more so than the very small radius around the radio station. And, um, you know, for a while there, I was building up an audience. I got a friend of mine that I came to know because I worked in a record store at the time on Long Island at Record World in Roosevelt Field, for those of you who are familiar with the chain or that area. And um, I met a guy there that we became very good friends with. I found out he knew Beatles music really well. He knew the solo music really well, which impressed me. He became my co-host on the show for about a year. He left uh, after that time. And then I had to decide whether I was gonna do anything by myself again. And um, the first radio station that I sent the tape to, which happens to be uh, because of someone we were just talking about before this show, Dave Morell, a music industry veteran who's done a lot of promo work in radio. He suggested that I send a tape to WDHA, which is a rock station in northern New Jersey. And the program director there at the time, Mark Chernoff, took my show and it ran mm -hmm. for exactly 10 years. Is and that I had no idea Mark Chernoff worked at WDHX. Oh, yeah. He was there for many years. I he left in, He left in 1985 to become program director at WNEW FM. And is now at WFAN. That's right. So, yeah. all right. Just pause one second. So let's put, uh, let's get a timeline going. 
first to me. The Beatles, uh, the Beatles show starts, you say, 1982? Yes, on okay. college radio. And this is at w, w, uh, NYT, right on Long Island. Okay, next stop is WDHA in 1983. But... Now, uh, where does the station, and I forget their old call, uh, in Briarcliff Manor at the time in, up in Westchester County, you were working there, but you weren't doing a Beatles show? Or no. I, myself? That's actually where you and I met, Darren. Right. And that was and that, at WZFM, WZFM, which was in White Plains, New York. And um, I was only doing overnight shifts there, and I was doing their soft adult contemporary format at the time. So I worked from midnight in the morning till 6 in the morning. Okay. All right. So that's non Beatles. So we won't dwell on this. But that is where Ken and I met when Ken was at uh, ZFM. What was it? WZFM? <laughs> WZFM, which yeah, is currently, okay. it, it's now the peak. The peak. Yeah. Right. 171 in White Plains. But, right. Um, uh, you knew a mutual friend of mine. I was in my first days at WFUV. Uh, and a friend of mine who, who knew you, uh, I don't know how well he knew you, but, uh, said we have to go and hang out and, and meet Ken Michaels. So he knew you, I would be meeting you. And it was uh -huh. actually, I remember it being December 24th because it was like Christmas Eve morning that we went up there and hung out at the studios at ZFM for a couple of hours, I guess, during your overnight. And this was would have had to have probably 1984 when I met you. Makes sense. And, and then we yeah. arranged an interview. That was right. We were doing, a, I believe, a John Lennon special on WFUV. And um, we interviewed you. We did the interview at the studios of, uh, uh, was it W? Was it was it NYT or at CW Post's um, radio station? I don't remember. You know, it probably was at CW Post or at, at New York Tech. One right. or the other. I don't remember doing we, outside work at WZFM other than just doing my show on the air, doing right. any production so, work of any kind. Or yeah. Okay, so we conducted the interview with you uh, on Long Island at either CW Post's radio station at Long Island University or New York Tech's radio station, and the rest is history. So back to you. So DHA takes you on, and your Beatles show now is in northern New Jersey. Continue. <laughs> Yeah, well, the show, that's really where I learned my craft at doing the Beatles show. And it, it became, I believe, the most unique Beatles program on the radio. And I'm saying that because I always believe that there's so many different levels of Beatles fans out there that in order to please all of them, you got to have something for everyone. So my show was always a mixture of playing hit records that everyone knew with deep cuts, playing group music, solo music. Everything that I've ever talked about as far as the book all together now from Wally Pedrazic and Harry Castleman, songs the Beatles were involved with for other artists, cover versions of Beatles songs, uh, novelty records, tribute songs, it all got mixed together and I developed interesting thematic sets every single week. It could be anything. It could be songs that have Eric Clapton on them, political songs from John, songs that feature Paul on drums. All kinds of unique themes that I have every single week, which I'm still doing to this day on my syndicated show for every little thing. And I also have news every single week because I didn't want the Beatles to be thought of as a purely nostalgia act. And you'd be surprised every single week how much news there is. Still is today, as witnessed by what we talk about here on this show. I do that. I have done a lot of interviews that I've mixed into the program. And I've had so many different forms of Beatles trivia and games that I put into the show. And if you want a taste of that, that's always on my website now, because every week there's some kind of Beatles trivia question or a game to play. And it's really just a carryover of everything else that I've done on, on the show Every Little Thing. The show Every Little Thing, by the way, when it started out on, on WNYT, moving over to WDHA, was just called the All Request Beatles Show, because I couldn't even think of anything creative <laughs> for a title for, for my show. And um, it was only when XM Radio took my show, uh, which was in 2003, that the title was changed to Every Little Thing because I was going through all the, the titles of Beatles songs and solo songs and trying to find one that would make sense. 
I know there's already been Scott Meany's ticket to ride and there's a Beatles show called Magical Mystery Tour. And, you know, every little thing really sums up what my show is because mm-hmm. it covers everything the Beatles ever touched. Anything they've ever done is part of their catalog to me. Songs they wrote for other people, songs they play on for other people, their group music, their solo music, Wings, Plastic Ono Band, classical music, Traveling Wilburys. It's all part of one catalog to me. And it's all mixed together in one show. So that's what the show during those 10 years, those were the most intense years of my radio career, developing that show and pouring my heart and soul into a live program um, every single week for, on Sunday mornings. It started out being two hours. It was expanded to three hours. When the Lost Lennon tapes was syndicated, we carried the show on WDHA. We ran it at six o'clock in the morning, right before my show. So Beatle fans had four hours of programming on the radio on Sunday mornings. And then when the Lost Lennon tapes ended and it got morphed into the Beatle years, we carried that as well. So, you know, it was an exciting time to have four hours of Beatle programming. And incidentally, I did a lot of specials based on what was in the Lost Lennon tapes. (laughs) I would do something like the alternate Imagine album, the alternate Mind Games album. And, you know, some of that stuff, which eventually there are bootlegs for that kind of thing. You have a different take of each song from each John Lennon album. I was doing stuff like that, too, on the radio during my 10 years there in WDHA. Did you do interviews all through, or when did that start? I have done interviews since I started on college radio. Mm -hmm. The very first interview I ever remember doing was John Wiener, who Uh wrote the book uh, Come Together, John Lennon and His Time. And that was all about John's political activities. That was my first. And, um, you know, in all the years since, interviews have been continuous. I like interviewing just about anybody, you know, even uh, especially musicians that are like session musicians that have worked with them. Because to me, there's nothing more important than talking to the people who actually were in the studio with them during the creative process. And, and Beatle authors are very important, too, you know. But um, to me, I find it really fascinating if I'm talking to someone like uh, a David Spinoza, for example, which I did back in the 80s. And, uh, or Ken Asher, who played on Mind Games and, and Walls and Bridges. You know, people like that. There may be people in radio who might think, well, those are just session people. They're not all that important. (laughs) I think anyone who's ever been in a studio with any of the Beatles is important. So, um, yeah, and I've interviewed so many people now, and my website's got many of those interviews, certainly not all of them. Hey, well, here's to another 2,000 shows, Ken, and hopefully you'll be able to talk uh, (laughs) 2,000 shows from now. But it has been uh, a very long and a very uh, exciting career and that continues on now. As for right now, what is the situation now? The uh, Every Little Thing as a live radio program on WNHU, that's been suspended because of the virus, correct? Because this, I guess the studios are they're, they're either closed or they're on like autopilot they're com- right now? They're completely closed. Okay. And it's run on automation. So until okay. the, that's, a, that's the New Haven University... Uh, radio station. So once the college campus opens up, then hopefully then I'll be back doing my show on Wednesday nights. And by the way, the show that I do that's the live broadcast is a completely different show than the syndicated show. You read show. my mind. Yeah, I was just yeah. going to say that, it, which I didn't really uh, realize, I don't think. There are technically two every little yes. things. Yep. It's the syndicated one and one that lives uh, at WNHU, again, that's on hiatus. Right. But um, on NHU, the difference is that I can take requests and play them, you know, right. as the show's going on. And uh, I take requests by email and by phone. Right. And, uh, yeah, I, I really enjoy being on the air live more than anything else. I don't know. It's a whole different vibe altogether. I suppose it's the right. same thing with a musician that likes to perform on stage, maybe more so than being in the studio doing his work. But, you know, I think I come across much better when I'm doing a live show. That's me personally. So you're producing your shows at home. The yes. syndicated little thing. Do you wear pants? That's a very personal question that I don't think I'm going to tackle right now. <laughs> but that's one of the luxuries. That's one of the luxuries of being able to do a show from your home. 
listen, congratulations on, 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 on a great milestone. And from the minute I met you, uh, uh, you were a, a Beatles uh, aficionado and uh, you've c continued on being uh, one of the leading voices in this country when it comes to Beatles uh, music uh, on the broadcast radio, now podcasts, internet and whatnot. So uh, again, congratulations on a great milestone uh, that you've passed 2000 yes. Beatles shows hosted by okay. Ken Michael. Thank you, Darren. Cheers. <laughs> any, 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 uh, any uh, 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 final thoughts on this, uh, Alan, before we move on to our topic? Have you ever in the 2000 shows gotten tired of it and decided you wanted to do, say, an Andrew Lloyd Webber show instead? <laughs> <laughs> many, many times. And um, I wanted to have you on as, as uh, my primary guest speaker for the show. Oh, I have um, plenty to yeah. say about Andrew Lee. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, I mean, it's uh, you, you, 2,000 shows, uh, you know, some of them obviously are, you know, live radio and requests and whatever, but you can, you, you have to come up with topics and uh, it's, you know, it's not easy, I know. And uh, for 2,000 of them, that's quite a lot. So, well, it, you know, to my advantage, it's because I have all the solo music to work with right. that I can do so much more. You know, there's <laughs> a difference. Once you add all the solo music, you've got over 100 titles to work from mm -hmm. as far as albums are concerned. Right. Yeah. So uh, there's so much music to draw on there. And the only thing I always hate to bring this up, but you know, there are people who are aware of this who listen to the radio. There is something called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Mm which prevents you from playing. This only pertains to the digital broadcast. It's only concerning the stream. It has nothing to do with the FM broadcast or the AM broadcast, but you're not permitted to play more than four songs by the same artist within a three hour block. Okay. So you will never hear even in the live broadcast on WNHU or my syndicated show, more than four Beatles songs. But you can also hear for solo John, for solo Paul. You can hear for solo George, Ringo. You can hear for Traveling Wilbury songs in the show. You could hear cover versions and all the other things that I mentioned. It forces you to be creative. Mm -hmm. when so, you, when you're, so Wings tracks count as separate from Paul tracks. So you could have eight Paul tracks if you wanted. You know, I'm not even sure about that. I just figure if I'm not sure... Don't even take a chance. Mm. You know, you've you've got Paul McCartney and Wings. You've got Wings. You've got Paul and Linda McCartney. You've got Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder. You know, mm -hmm. you know is it all just Paul McCartney? Um, I just consider it all Paul. You know, yeah, I, really actually, think, I really do think Wings is something really different from a solo Paul McCartney record. That's how I feel about it. But just to be safe, I'd rather not go beyond four that have... You know, that's a Paul post Beatles recording. Mm -hmm. Let me provide a legal argument for you. <laughs> Were you to want to try it and they challenge you. The rationale that Paul used when he put out Another Day um, as Paul and Linda and had it published by Chapel Music instead of ATV was that, well, I may still be Paul McCartney, but this songwriting team is not Lennon McCartney, it's McCartney and McCartney, and that is a different entity. So that was his argument. So if they were to try to stop you, you could just use Paul's argument on them. Um, I feel very comfortable if I could just call on Paul to <laughs> defend me right. on it. There you go. And incidentally, for anyone wondering, you know, it's, uh, something like the Beatles channel on Sirius XM, that is streaming, okay? Mm -hmm. The only reason that that exists is because Apple approved it. Right. In order to do something like that, you need the artist, if it's a solo artist, or the band, or in this case, the four parties at Apple, to approve that channel at SiriusXM. So anytime SiriusXM has anything, a Willie Nelson channel, a Bruce Springsteen channel, it's, a, it's approved by the artist. It has to be. Nobody can just do that, legally anyway. Mm. So... All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, Ken, are there any other you know special programs that you were involved in uh, beyond every little thing, things we said today, and talk more talk? I think that um, one of the biggest highlights of my career 
back in 1998, when the John Lennon anthology box set came out, I was working as a producer in New York City for the ABC radio networks, where I helped to produce syndicated shows. And they asked me to produce a special for the John Lennon anthology uh, box set. And so I strictly produced it. I didn't host it. I mixed everything. And if there was anything wrong with the script, I would be involved with that. But that was the only radio special connected to the John Lennon anthology box set that came out. So I produced that. And then um, in 2010, uh, there was a company out of Queens that actually helped to kickstart my show, Every Little Thing, for syndication. And they had asked me, they were approached to do a special for Band on the Run for the box set when that came out, the first of McCartney's archival box sets. And they asked me if I wanted to host it. <laughs> so I said, yes, I think I'd be quite interested in hosting the show. And so that went out. And what I love about that particular special that I can't say about anything else is that it's the only time I ever just did the voice and nothing else. I didn't have to produce it. They just had me read a script. Mm -hmm. I did approve the script. But still, I mean, I wasn't involved with the production at all. And that special aired on something like 230 radio stations for Band on the Run. And that was like the biggest thing that had happened to me in my career, apart from being on XM Radio, which sometimes people may not be aware. I was actually on XM Radio from 2003 through January of 2009. And I had my show, Every Little Thing, on one of their channels, which they abandoned channel called uh, fine tuning when the merger happened with Sirius XM I lost my show every little thing on there and I also did um, short features on their 60s channel the 60s on six I did Beatles news breaks there and I did something called Beatle breaks where it would be information based around a song or an album by the Beatles that they would air on the 60s channel so um, definitely the special for the John Lennon anthology box set and the Band on the Run box set. Those are two very big highlights. There's one other thing that was a big thrill for me, which is that in 1992, when Paul McCartney turned 50, and I was still doing my show on WDHA in New Jersey, I had a special, a birthday special for him, where I counted down my listeners' 50 favorite Paul McCartney songs of all time. And the results of that special turned up in Club Sandwich. Hmm. So nice. all 50 songs were listed. My name was put in Club Sandwich. WDHA was mentioned. And it was quite an honor. So I'm in one issue <laughs> of Club Sandwich, which, as everyone knows, is the McCartney newsletter that, that uh, MPL put out, I think it was four times a year. So to get my name in there was a, a tremendous honor for me. Mm -hmm. Well, no matter how you look at it, from any angle, every angle, all your accomplishments, you've done over 2,000 radio shows on the Beatles alone, and that's a heck of an accomplishment, not to mention the fact that there was a boatload of uh, uh, regular radio that wasn't Beatle-oriented that, uh, uh, that you accomplished, that you did. And so congratulations, Ken, on, on, a, on a great achievement. Uh, over 2,000 Beatles shows um, on the radio and other media. So congrats. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Alan. And many more, Ken. And, <laughs> and thanks to all now, my listeners who have followed me, whether it's just discovering the work that I'm doing now with all these different shows or any of them from the long ago past. <laughs> That's an album, isn't it? The long ago past. I think Procol Harris. Nah, anyway, uh, yes. Yeah, so once again, congratulations, Ken. And that brings us to the topic of uh, today's show, uh, which gives the three of us an opportunity to share our opinions on what could very well be a controversial topic. What are our least favorite Beatles songs? And we decided that each one of us would pick five. Uh, that are our least favorite. And I know from the ones that I've picked, uh, this could make for some very interesting debating. But uh, before we get into our picks, uh, Ken lined up a bunch of uh, rules and parameters for what songs are eligible 
uh, what songs are eligible for us to pick, what songs were eligible, I should say, for us to pick, what songs we should overlook when picking our least favorites by the Beatles. Ken? Yeah, it was a combination of that and ultimatums that I gave to the two of you <laughs> for this topic. Um, actually, I should say this idea originally came from you, Darren. You wanted us to talk about our least favorite Beatles songs and solo Beatles songs. So at some point, we'll do it on the solo, too. But also okay. one of our, one of our other listeners, Bruce Muni, who actually dates all the way back to my years at WDHA in New Jersey listening to me, suggests that we do the same thing. So uh, you must have been uh, communicating with each other, I think. Great minds. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, what I wanted to do is just make this fairly simple, which is to stick to the core catalog, the EMI catalog of the Beatles, going from Love Me Do through the Let It Be album. No BBC material, no deck audition material, no anthology material, no Tony Sheridan material. Just those albums, the songs that we've grown up with from what we consider the core catalog of the Beatles. And um, I also wanted to make sure that we meant full, complete songs, meaning a song like Her Majesty, I don't think of in the same way as I would a complete song or Dig It or um, what else? Uh, Maggie May. Wild Honey or, Pie. Wild Honey Pie. Those songs. They're in a different category altogether. And I do believe Revolution Number 9, it's not really a song. It's more an experimental production piece. It's really in a class all by itself. So I wouldn't count any of those songs. Okay? Personally, I do believe that Free as a Bird and Real Love should count, but I, I have a feeling none of us are going to pick those anyway. But um, I do consider those you know, complete songs, and they are Beatles recordings, and um, so, and when it came to the anthology stuff, I, I don't, there's a reason I believe why the Beatles rejected those songs, the unreleased songs, like If You Got Trouble and uh, That Means A Lot. And those songs, I don't think they're in the same category as what they officially released back in the 60s through 1970 with Let It Be. So it's basically those songs that we're picking. Okay. Oh, and okay. one more thing. I also thought that, eh, you know. The German versions of She Loves You and I Want to Hold Your Hand are not in the same category either. Okay, those are specialty recordings there. Okay, so uh, just to recap, <laughs> we, aren't, <laughs> we aren't considering in our lists of least favorite Beatles songs, BBC material, Decca audition tape, stuff on the three anthology albums, My Bonnie, Ain't She Sweet, um, Not Guilty, uh, Her Majesty, and stuff along those lines. Revolution 9 uh, to uh, Cry for a Shadow. Those tunes are not being considered. So we're just right. going with the four catalog released on an EMI label and uh, no kind of like experimental half-baked uh, throw-in tunes like um, Wild Honey Pie. All right. Hmm. So being that you made, uh, set all these rules and threatened us if we picked uh, any of these uh, shorter songs. Uh, we're going to put you on the spot and you're going to go with your five least favorite Beatles songs, Ken Michaels. I have to go first? Yes. Okay. All right. That's first your, that's of all, bet. let me just clarify. We're saying least favorite. These are songs that I would not call their worst songs. Okay. These are not songs okay. that I hate. I don't hate any Beatles songs. To me, Beatles songs go from good to great. So even my least favorite Beatles song to me is still a good song. And I pick these based on the songs that I probably would prefer not to play right now. Okay? That's how I feel today in the moment. It's not even a reflection of how good a song it is as a composition. Because one of the songs that I picked and the first one I'm going to mention, you'll probably be shocked. First song I'm going to say is Revolution Number 1. Hmm. The reason that I mention that one is because I love the fast version so much. And when I played the slow one, you know, I like it, but I keep saying, pick it up, pick it up. I like it so much more as an up-tempo rocker. It's one of the greatest rockers in rock history, as far as I'm concerned. And yeah, I like it as the slow version. 
I just don't feel like hearing it as much as most of the Beatles catalog. That's all. I mean, there's, there's a lot I like about it. I love the harmonies and the, you know, shooby doo ops in there. <laughs> but um, it drags, you know. But I still, I still like it. You know, it's just these are the ones that I like the least. I all also right, that's put, one. Yeah, little child is in there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a, it's a good energetic early Beatles song there. I don't know why. Maybe it's just a little bit too simple for me. Although I love all the energy and I love the harmonica solo in it. I don't know. For some reason, maybe it's just too simple a song. I don't, I still, if I ever heard it on the radio, I'd play it. If I'm going through with the Beatles as a CD, I'm going to play it. But um, that's just one that I think less of than the other songs. Another one I put in there was the continuing story of Bungalow Bill. Maybe because, um, you know, I, I just don't enjoy it as much as I used to. Maybe it's too repetitive in the sing-along. It's, uh, it may be a little bit too forced, a song, I think, from John. He didn't really do a lot of those sing-along type songs. Mm-hmm. Although, hey, you know, all you need is love could be that. But, um, you know, I think more of Paul for those kind of songs like Yellow Submarine and all together now and those kind of songs again i still like it it's just one of my least favorites that's all i also put in my only cover version here a taste of honey for some reason it kind of drags i like it but i love all the other covers so much more than that one it's unique in the sense that you know it's a show tune just like till there was you was but till there was you is such a better song to me and um Again, I feel very funny doing these top five because I don't dislike these songs. I just like these the least. And the number one pick of all of them has to be Dig a Pony. Hmm. The lyrics are really silly. Not that that means anything. I mean, I am the walrus. Has right, just gonna say. This lyric, you know, but um, I don't know. It just kind of meanders that song it doesn't grab me as much and uh john is known so much for being a great lyricist and yet there are times when he has fun with the lyrics like i just mentioned i am the walrus or one of you know alan's favorite songs what's the new mary jane (laughs) but um you know dig a pony is another song kind of like that where what does it mean and sometimes when i defend other songs huh (laughs) he likes a pony Okay. He likes ponies. But I, I do a road hog where you can penetrate any place you go. That You see, today, that lyric is a dangerous lyric. <laughs> you know, uh, you can't go around singing, you know, you can pen- Anyway, I should stop now. I did say it's a family show up to, at, uh, at the top. So you ranked them. You went five to one. You put them in order. Or I don't even you know. The, number the, one the, is- well, Number one and number two are my two least favorites. Those I knew automatically. The others I had to go through the whole catalog and pick them. Right. So, yeah, definitely Dig a Pony is among my least favorites and A Taste of Honey. But then again, okay. if it came on the radio, I'd play it. I'd listen. I would never turn off right. any of the Beatles songs. So, okay. So uh, let's, let's recap here uh, for those of you who may be run uh, the little child fan club or the continuing huh. story of bungalow bill facebook page you, <laughs> you can send your hate mail to ken michaels uh because ken does not i dig a pony a taste of honey he likes them but they're his least favorites let me correct myself i dig a pony a taste of honey the continuing story of bungalow bill little child and revolution one right all right Correct. Over to Alan Cozen. Okay, so I have to, you know, say the same caveat that Ken did about, you know, these are not songs that I dislike particularly. I mean, I, I think of the Beatles as the, as the zenith of Western civilization, so, like, um, there's nothing I would get rid of. Um, I just want more. I mean, it's it's kind of like saying, you know, the, the Beethoven Fourth Symphony is my least favorite Beethoven symphony, but... For God's sake, it's still the Beethoven Fourth Symphony, you know? So that's the same with these. Uh, I didn't rank them 
but one that uh, we've all talked about a lot before, I, I know you can guess Ken probably, is Mr. Moonlight. Um, <laughs> you know, there are great things in Mr. Moonlight, like John's opening <laughs> scream of the uh, title. Uh, yeah. I think it's probably the organ part or something that makes me think it's it just doesn't have the same kind of sound as the rest of that album and the rest of what the Beatles did. It just, it just, I, I think it's something about the organ sound that bothers me. And similarly, tell me what you see that electric piano part just sounds huh. a little cheesy to me, but you know, again, I kind of like the song. It's just that it's just, there's something about the recording of it in both cases, I guess it's the recording of it more than the song uh, or the instrumentation or the arrangement, whatever you would, would say is, just something like like that ask me why like ask me why um but uh you know it has that sort of latin american thing that i don't think the beatles did quite as well as other groups that specialize in latin american kind of stuff do and it just it, it, it seemed very derivative and you know and of course it's it's like the flip side of their second single you know it's it's very early in the game. Um, they hadn't totally hit their stride yet when they wrote it, but you know, it's, and again, you know, you put on, ask me why I'm not going to say, turn that off. It's like, you know, an Andrew Lloyd Webber track or something. It's, you know, it, it's, <laughs> <laughs> I did pick till there was you probably, probably for the same reason that Ken picked uh, the taste of honey. Um, hmm. I don't particularly like show tunes. And Till There Was You, I mean, it just seems a little bit soppy and everything. And yet it has George's uh, solo on a classical guitar, which is a really nice solo. And uh, I suppose if I had to sort of wheel down the song instead of getting rid of the song, well, we're not talking about getting rid of the songs, but, but that part of it I really like. Um, it's the recording as a whole that just seems to me... I'd rather have heard another Lennon McCartney song probably at that point on the album. Uh, and the last one, again, a tough choice is Blue Jay Way. Um, mm. Yeah, mm. it just seems kind of droning and draggy to me. Although, you know, I like plenty of droning and draggy things. So, um, you know, I think of all of George's songs, it's probably the one I like least. Um, you know, I thought, you know, he, he was very critical of Don't Bother Me. I love Don't Bother Me. And with Blue Jay Way, you know, I know the whole backstory of waiting for his friends and all that stuff. It, it just, I think of all of the stuff he did, which is quite a varied catalog, that's the one that grabs me the least. So, all right. Yeah. Very interesting. I'm surprised on a few of those choices. I heard. But to me, to me, I mean, ask me why is so different considering that it's you know 1962 when they recorded that and doing the latin stuff which i think they i think they sounded pretty natural doing it and, and compositionally it's very different for a pop song at that time mm -hmm. you know i don't think that george martin ever gave enough credit to that song you know when he said the best they could come up with was love me do i think ask me why is a far more interesting song than Love Me Do. It's got a lot more going on there. And I love Love Me Do, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But um, you know, I think it was I think it was pretty advanced for that early stage in their career to come up with that song. Ask okay. me why. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, you know, on, right. a, on a different day it might not be on my list. So <laughs> it's you know, it's it's it, it was hard it was really hard for me to come up with a list of five least favorite Beatles songs. Yeah. All so. right. Well there's Alan Cozen's picks, Mr. Moonlight, and you knew that was showing up in uh, a discussion like this, uh, least favorite Beatles songs. Tell me what you say, Ask Me Why, the Beatles cover of Till There Was You, and Blue Jay Way, and although he likes Droney and Draggy, he doesn't like Blue Jay Way, Droney and no, Draggy. I didn't say he didn't uh, like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem he with this discussion. <laughs> All right, I'm going to just get you just, you know, these are Beatles songs that suck. I hate them. 
Uh, I don't ever want to. No, I'm kidding. I'm just joking. But it's it's just just kind of be a little different. All right. So we have your five, Alan and Ken's five and my five. Mine are going to, I think, catch uh, a lot of people uh, off guard here. I alphabetized mine and I actually couldn't decide between two of them. So mine is like five and a half songs. All right. So here are my five least favorite Beatles songs. And no, I don't hate them. They don't suck. And I do want to hear them many, many times. Even the Beatles' weakest moments, other bands would kill to have. And the other thing is that, you know, if you're doing lists like this and ranking things, whether uh, you're saying these are my least favorite or these are my favorite or these are the songs that, in my opinion, are the best or whatever, something's got to fall to the bottom. Something's got to rise to the top. Starting off, my first song is Day Tripper. And I just never connected with that song. I think it's a great guitar riff, but that's about it. It, uh, I mean, in that case, I have nothing more. It just never appealed to me, Day Tripper. Okay. Uh, I don't like the, I, I don't like the, uh, I'm not crazy for the um, uh, Day Tripper. Yeah, it took me so long. It, it doesn't do all that much for me, that tune. But that was also one of the last songs I added in, and something had a slot in towards four and five on my list. So it was Day Tripper. Next up, Drive My Car. That was a song I've actually never really cared for all that much. Never could figure out what it was about. I'm um, not really crazy about the way the uh, there's very little variation in uh, the melody. You know, da 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 not terribly exciting, uh, but I get it. I understand that people are probably thinking, huh? I mean, these are classics. They just mm-hmm. don't, uh, they don't resonate with me. There are two songs that are kind of, kind of a tie, and I'm going to break the tie right now. I was going to include Little Child in my, um, being the Ken picked it, I'll take Little Child out because I do have uh, a song I could replace it with. Uh, before I get to the song, because it's uh, not in alphabetical order. Before I get to that replacement song, my third one is Love Me Do. Just maybe a classic example of this was one of the earlier Lennon-McCartney compositions, and you could, you know, it sounds like that. You know, it's a very simple song that, you know, I think they, I think you listen to Love Me Do, and then you go to something like Please Please Me. You could see there how they grew as songwriters almost instantaneously. Uh, Just not much happening with Love Me Do. If there was ever a song in the Beatles canon that's dated, it's that one for me. And then the replacement for Little Child, I'm going to go with their version of rock and roll music. Lennon's vocal is killer. Perhaps it's just because I've heard the song by the Beatles and by Chuck Berry and by the Beach Boys so many times over the years that it sort of lost, loses its effect on me uh so you know i figure uh one cover it's rock and roll music on my list and sit down for my final pick uh at the bottom of my list it's yesterday what um never found it a particularly uh interesting melody um was never crazy lyrically about it either i thought mccartney's written dozens of better ballads than yesterday Never found it a particularly interesting song, honestly. And really, for the longest time, that would be probably my least favorite uh, of all the Beatle tunes. You know, I don't, again, lyrically, it doesn't do much for me. And I just think the melody is kind of uninteresting. So there are my five. You think that maybe in the case of yesterday, the song might suffer because you might feel that it's been so overplayed through the years? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That, yeah, oh, I'm sure. It could very well. I mean, we'll never know. I'll never know. I can't wipe out of my memory the thousands of times I've heard it. But that could definitely uh, play into that. I mean, there's other Beatles songs that I like that didn't make this list and that I didn't even consider for the list that if they were played as much as yesterday was, I might not, might, might, might not care for them either. Um, Airplay's probably part of it. That's a good point, Ken. Mm-hmm. I always try to not let that affect my judgment. Because, for example, a song like Stairway to Heaven from Led Zeppelin, I got burnt out on 
very quickly on rock radio and I didn't want to hear it for the longest time, but I will always acknowledge it's a great song. Mm -hmm. I I don't want radio to affect overall my opinion about the song. You know what though, when you, and, and, and at least only speaking for myself, when you work in radio, that's very hard to do because if somebody hears a song 10 times, I hear it a hundred, you know what I'm (laughs) saying? So in the case, you know, that's just the way. And as the years have gone by, it's the way my brain has been programmed to react. You know, what's okay. I felt the same way about Stairway to Heaven, but it seemed as though the, there was a backlash where classic rock radio, at least in the New York City metropolitan area, completely turned their back on Stairway to Heaven. That it became, when you hear it now, it's like, wow, they haven't played this in a while. And again, I'm just talking about um, you know, New York City metropolitan area rock stations in recent years, and there aren't all that many to begin with. But, um, you know, when you work in radio, you know what? This is, I know it's a Beatles show, but Fleetwood Mac's Rumors album is a good example of a perfect album, a classic album, but one that I have little interest in putting on when I reach for Fleetwood Mac. What's my favorite Fleetwood Mac album? Tusk. Mm. It's not Rumors. And mm. that's because... You know, it's you're, it's you're burnt out point. on you're burnt out. Yeah, on right. yeah. So that's probably why yesterday and maybe even love me do. And the first two day tripper and drive my car. Those were really what pushed them over the edge. And if there was any one on my list that I could that I would remove, probably day tripper. That was one that I had to. All right. I got to come up with a fifth, you know. Uh, so that's my five day tripper. Drive my car. Love me do rock and roll music. Yesterday, honorable mention, Little Child, Ken went with Revolution One, Little Child, the continuing story of Bungalow Bill, A Taste of Honey, I Dig a Pony, or Dig a Pony, and Alan Cozen, Mr. Moonlight, Tell Me What You See, Ask Me Why, Till There Was You, Blue Jay Way. Hmm. What are your opinions? <laughs> well, I think Darren's We'd like was pretty flabbergasting, actually. <laughs> huh. you know, I'm I mean, stunned. I'm like, not... not going to criticize Darren's taste or, or, or anything like that. Or it's, it's not like, you know, some of these political debates people get into in Facebook now. Um, but yesterday, I mean, I don't know, like, I think of yesterday as like one of the great contributions that Paul McCartney has made, not just to the Beatles catalog, but to pop music in general. So it, it, I, I was really surprised to hear that one. You know, to to each his own, and um, I I also can probably see why because of the amount it's been played and the amount it's been covered and and all of that. But um, yeah, that was my reaction. And and I'm glad actually that I feel the way I feel because it made for an interesting conversation. Hmm. You know, and like I said, I mean, you said this, Alan, before. Let's do this show again in six months. There probably would be a change or two in my list. Yeah. And I mean, there was a time where without batting an eyelash, if you asked me what my favorite Beatles songs were, the first first song out of my mouth would be Hey Jude. And that's not the case anymore, probably because, you know, of ex- overexposure. I may not even if we did a top five favorites, I'm not sure Hey Jude would even be on it anymore. Mm hmm. Uh, so things will change, opinions change, tastes change. I know I didn't always feel this way about yesterday, like when I was younger, you know, so mm-hmm. that, that that's where exposure could come into play, that I wasn't burned out on it yet. Right. Today, I, I am. Hmm. Well, if people like contrast in their opinions, they're getting it in this show at this time. I mean, the five that you picked, Darren, I, I couldn't disagree more. But then, hey, that's why we're here to talk about our differing opinions on these songs. I mean, rock and roll music to me is one of the greatest covers of any song, the Beatles version of that song. I mean, it's so energetic. John's vocals are amazing. The build up towards the end with the pianos coming in and it's all like, you know, two and a half minutes. It's, it's just such an exciting record. You know, it's, it's hard for me to even envision anyone not liking rock and roll music. And I also think Till There Was You, Alan, is one of their best covers. Mm -hmm. It's so unique for the Beatles to do show music, which they were also doing in Hamburg, too. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there was a reason why they did that song on the Ed Sullivan show, and it was in part to 
broaden their appeal, mm-hmm. you know, maybe for an older demographic sure. who would know the song from being in The Music Man. But Paul sounded so natural doing that song. And like you said, that guitar solo from George is, to me, it's one of his greatest guitar solos. And nobody ever really points that out. So unique for its time for a rock band. And Day Tripper, I mean, a lot of people look at that as one of the ultimate classic rock songs, period. Um, You know, but we all have different opinions. Drive My Car. You know, songs that are rock songs do not necessarily have to have great melodies to be a great rock song. You know, and Drive My Car stays on that note in the verses. It's true. But for whatever reason, it works. And it's got more of an R&B feel, that particular song, I think, anyway. But that's just my opinion. You know, Drive My Car, I have trouble at this point um, separating from Jimi Hendrix's Crosstown Traffic. I think Jimi Hendrix totally based Crosstown Traffic on Drive My Car. Um, listen, huh. listen to the guitar part on Drive My Car, you know, the little guitar figure in between lines, and then listen to Hendrix's on Crosstown Traffic. It's very similar. They're both automotive songs. And uh, Crosstown Traffic, maybe, I don't know, the, it may have more of a melody or maybe not i don't know but uh, but i think of those two songs exactly as linked totally linked the same way as chuck berry's i'm talking about you and i saw her standing there because the bass line mm-hmm. and i saw her standing there was basically taken from talking about you so there's a lot of these sort of cross cross pollination things and that would be why, for instance, I hadn't chosen Drive My Car, because I know that um, John considered it just sort of, you know, he used to talk about craftsmanship versus really song composition, and he thought of Drive My Car as, you know, craftsmanship. So I know he didn't like it, but nevertheless, um, I think the, the, the Hendrix link sort of has given it a new life for me. You should, yeah, you should really admire the song more if it influenced somebody else, Mm -hmm. especially Hendrix. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And rock and roll music, you know, I can see what Darren's saying in a way. I, you know, I love the track. I didn't choose it. But I have to say that as covers go, I think that if you go back to Chuck Berry's original, it has kind of a clarity and slinkiness that neither the Beach Boys nor the Beatles versions have since, since Darren mentioned them both. I just think that if I had to choose one of the three, I probably would choose Chuck Berry. Hmm. I was under the impression, Alan, that all the cover versions the Beatles did, you liked better than the originals. Most. Most. I'm not sure about rock and roll music, though. I think I think that's, that's it's close, you know, but um, I think I like Chuck Berry's better this week. <laughs> <laughs> See, we should do our top five favorite Beatles songs, too. Mm-hmm. And and like we all said, that could change all the time. Favorite Beatles album can change all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Well, there you have it. And, um, you know, with the v- various social media outlets, whatnot, Facebook, uh, if you want to sh- shoot us some emails, any way that you want to share with us what your least favorites are, uh, please do so. And speaking of email addresses, social media and whatnot, let's go around in a circle here and get everybody's contact information starting with Mr. 2000 plus Beatles show Ken Michaels <laughs> well thank you Darren uh, my email address is everylittlething at att.net the website that I have is kenmichaelsradio.com don't forget all the uh, many interviews that I have on the website from loads of people in the Beatle world including one with our own Alan Cozen that I did several years ago, and lots of prizes you can win on my Beatles trivia and games page every single week, including the brand new ebook for the revised version of Eight Arms to Hold You by Chip Mattinger and Mark Easter, uh, which is really the ultimate solo Beatles reference book taking you through the year 2000. And if you're not familiar with the book, you should have it. It's over 700 pages long, covers everything studio recordings live recordings film work tv work bootlegs what's not been bootlegged <laughs> even that is in the book 
as well. So yeah, there's that. And then there's my show, Talk More Talk, which is heard every other Monday night. It will be the following Monday from today. So that'll be June the 1st on our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. You can join me with uh, my colleagues, Kid O'Toole, Tom Hunyadi, and Mean Mr. Mayo. And we'll be talking about George Harrison's brainwashed album on that show. And if you want to catch my syndicated show for every little thing, go to my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. Look for the page that says every little thing. It lists all the radio stations that carries the show and when they broadcast it with a link to their websites so you can stream them. So even though I'm not on the air live with every little thing, you can always catch it, especially on the weekends. I'm heard almost throughout the day on the weekends on some radio station with every little thing. And again, that's at kenmichaelsradio.com. All right, Alan. Okay. Um, the easiest way to get to me is on Facebook, and I've got two pages, Alan Cozen and Alan Cozen Remixed. Either one will do. You can contact all of us or any of us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. That's all one word things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We have a Twitter account that is at things we said fab. And we have uh, two group Facebook pages, Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans, and just Things We Said Today. And it may be counterintuitive, but the sort of more official of those two is Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans, not just Things We Said Today. Although we post the show on both of them and we read comments on both of them. So either way you want to do it, there it is. All right. And as for me, you can send me an email at WFUV. And the email address is my name, Darren DeVivo, D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O at WFUV.org. I have two Facebook pages. Join them both. One is Darren DeVivo. The other is Darren DeVivo on WFUV radio. I'm kind of redefining their purpose. So in the meantime, feel free to like one and friend me on the other. Uh, that's Darren DeVivo and Darren DeVivo on WFUV, uh, the two Facebook pages for me. And that pretty much puts a wrap on this week's show, this two-week show. <laughs> uh, I know we have some special guests that we're talking about having in uh, future shows, so uh, hopefully you'll be joining us again in a couple of weeks uh, for Things We Said Today. With Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen. This is Darren DeVivo saying... Sayonara, wash your hands, and wear your mask. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.